One of my favorite things to do in the winter is to watch videos of gardeners showing me what they're going to plant. So we're going to do the same here today and talking about all the vegetables I'm going to grow in my garden for 2024 this year. So I'm super excited. So sit back, relax, get a coffee or tea and definitely a notebook because most of those varieties are still available at those seed companies as well in case you see something which you like. But then let's get going. I'm Steffi, I'm a home gardener here in Edinburgh, Massachusetts, Zone 6, and I just love you taking you along with my garden journey here on this platform and this channel. So welcome. Let's have a look at the garden space here from the top, which is really a great overview of my space. So the three large beds at the at the end are all eight by four cedar raised beds, which we love and which are we have grown in now for a few years in a row. The front three beds are Vigo metal raised beds, which are great as well. So it's like an um, seven and a half by three and a half bed. That's the one with the arch about it. And the other one, um, the smaller skinny one is just uh, seven and a half long and one and a half deep, but also all like 17 inches high. So I really enjoyed those beds as well. And that is where all where I grow all my vegetables in. I do have a little bit of an overflow section and my grow back garden in the driveway on a patch where we don't park, but it has perfect sun exposure. This is typically where I grow my potatoes in spring. That won't be included here. We'll do a separate video when we get to that, but we'll talk about all of the varieties I'm growing in my main garden today. And yeah, I also have some um, time timestamps below in case you're just looking for some inspiration for, I don't know, tomatoes, peppers, whatsoever. You'll find that below so you can jump ahead if you, if you want to. But then otherwise, let's get going here. I think when everybody um, would uh, give you the favorite vegetable to grow in a vegetable garden, I think I would say it's not a scientific study, but I would say like 70% of the people would easily say that tomatoes is the, uh, is the thing which they love to grow the most. And same here. <laughs> I love my tomatoes. I can't eat any tomatoes in the winter time because they just don't taste as good as the ones I eat in the summer, fresh out of my garden. So I'm super, super stoked to grow my tomatoes again. And as you can imagine, there are like what feels like a million different tomato varieties out there. So I always have a few new ones every year I try. So the ones which don't make the cut the, the previous year because they were either hard to grow or some, somewhat difficult or just didn't taste great. Yes, <laughs> can happen too, unfortunately. They get like kicked off the list and for that I'll uh, pull in something new. So, but let's start with my uh, three varieties which are forever grow because I just love them. And um, we we'll talk first heirloom varieties, then I have paste tomatoes, so the determined varieties, and then cherry tomatoes. So just as a, as a logic here, my first and favorite one is the black crim. It's just beautiful and so delicious. Like the tomato sandwiches I made with black crim are just ugh, mind blown. Um, and it's just, it's equally as beautiful as it is delicious. So that's always a great combo for me and gets double points. And it's also a plant which has performed well ever since I started growing them, no matter what the seasons were, if it was rainy or if we had to draw it in the summer, it always did very, very well for me and had high yields. The next one I love as well. Um, it's delicious, but I gotta say it's even more beautiful <laughs> and it is just a stunning color and that is the pink Berkeley tie-dye. This variegation on the tomatoes, like every time I see them, it blows my mind how beautiful they are and it's one of my most favorite um, subjects to take pictures with my good camera from in the summer out of the vegetable garden. Just love them. And then one which I finally tried last year after many of you recommended that to me is the Cherokee Purple. And I gotta say that taste has also blown my mind. It's also quite pretty, not as pretty as the Black Crim or the um, Berkeley Tie-Dye if you ask me, but the taste is just stunning. And it was in 
I think it was the best yielding tomato I had last year in my garden. So for that reason, it definitely got a repeat this year. And then I have two new varieties in the heirloom section. One which I clearly bought for the looks um, because it's so beautiful. It's a Harvest Moon. It's a new variety Johnny's introduced this year. And it's like this yellow with the red like marbled color inside of it just caught my eye so much. So I'm really curious to see how that performs. I've had a couple of um, tries with yellow tomatoes. They never did well for me. So I really hope that one changes my mind. And then the next one, this one I actually came across while I was looking for new cherry tomatoes varieties, which we come <laughs> to in a, in a minute or two, but it is, it's not a cherry tomato, but it's more like a smaller um, size tomato, like they call them like salad tomatoes, which are really nice to get cut up in the salad. Not the big heirloom one, so it's somewhere in the middle. So I'm curious to see how this will perform. And it's called Mountain Magic, just a plain red. Sometimes it's really nice to have like also something more simplistic in its, in its setup, right? I love to have the special ones, but then every once in a while I just love a plain old red <laughs> tomato, which tastes great. So I hope that this one will be it. Let's move on to the paste tomatoes because that's really the ones I grow the most because that's the way we use tomatoes the most in tomato sauces, marinara sauces or salsas. That's really what we love to do. And that's also a great way to preserve them past the summer. So we are here in the beginning of February and I still have a few jars from last year getting low and probably be out before we have new ones but let's see if we can optimize that this year a little bit more but i really love to can them and enjoy them in the winter it always tastes like summer when you when you have a glass of summer goodies for your chili or uh, stews whatsoever so this year i'm trying um, again the san marzano fun fact that it was the very first tomato i ever grew from seeds years ago and it did in that first year very very well for me but not afterwards anymore it always had some issues with blossom and rot and stuff so um but it's just such a great variety and such a classic tomato variety that i want to give it another try so i got some seeds from johnny's for that one another new to me one is the plum regal this is um just in really really beautiful plum tomato again for for paste tomatoes which looks very much like my all-time forever grow favorite of the paste tomatoes so i wanted to see another variety in, in that um, area how they will do in comparison with my favorite which is the plum perfect and the name is the game for this one it is the gorgeous most perfect plum shape typically the determined tomatoes come and produce tomatoes in one big flush so you have enough to can them and make paste out of it the plum perfect for me yes it has like one bigger harvest typically in the middle of august but then they still keep producing until the end of the season so for me they are one of my very very favorite tomatoes and a new forever grow variety because it is so beautiful but also so delicious with an rather uncommon taste is the Midnight Roma from Row 7. If you've been following me for a while, either on Instagram or on this platform here, you've heard me talking most likely about Row 7 seeds for a while because I'm a really, really big fan girl. <laughs> no affiliation with them, just a really big fan. They are a boutique seed grower or a seed breeder or however they're named, I don't know. <laughs> They offer only, I think, like 15 or 20 unique varieties, but all of them are bred for taste. And let me tell you, last year was the first year where I tried to grow almost every variety they had. Sounds more than it is. It was like, again, like 10 different varieties across all like vegetables. And we'll see a lot of them here as well. But they are so delicious and so unique in the taste. So I can highly recommend to check them out. Seeds are not the cheapest, but also not the most expensive ones. Um, can highly, highly recommend them. This Midnight Roma, it is so stunningly beautiful, but also so delicious. It is like almost like a creamy texture, but for in like my other paste tomatoes, I don't like them in a salad or 
like in a caprice or so. But that Midnight Roma, number one, it's gorgeously stunning, but the taste goes super well to just eat them uh, fresh as well. So they are like a mix for me. I love to eat them fresh as well. I've used them for canning and this dark color gives the sauce such a beautiful color as well. So I highly, highly recommend. Let's move on to the cherry tomatoes. So I love to grow cherry tomatoes um, just because they're my favorite snacking tomatoes all season long um, once the summer gets going. One of my favorite applications for cherry tomatoes is actually to dehydrate them. And when I have those dehydrated cherry tomatoes in a jar, I use them all winter long to sprinkle them into chilies, stews, whatsoever. They rehydrate super, super quick in any type of soup or stew or chili, and they just taste like summer again. It is gorgeous. I can highly recommend to try that out. So for that reason, I grow three cherry tomato plants, typically like for us here as a, a family of like um, five adults here, we don't need like three cherry tomatoes. They are highly, highly productive. So careful what you get yourself into when you grow cherry tomato plants. But with me, dehydrating most of it um, or a good portion of it it's really a great way of usage so that's why I have three plants otherwise I would probably just have two and last year I had a very hard disappointment with two varieties so I'm not growing those ones anymore so I was looking for uh, two new varieties to fill in the spot and I asked around on Instagram I think that was my most responded question sticker ever <laughs> I think I had like pages and pages of people um, recommending me varieties and one of the highest recommend recommendation was the Sunrise Bumblebee for taste but also for the looks so I added this one and then the other one was the super sweet which is just a plain red but also supposedly super super great in taste so I'm really excited to grow this next to my forever grow which is a sun gold if you're looking for the perfect cherry tomato here you are that's it come and fight me on that one <laughs> It is uh, the perfect tomato bite in one bite. It is gorgeous. So let's move on to the lettuce I love to grow. So as you might know, my theme for this year is simplicity and I only want to grow what we eat. In terms of lettuces, I don't know how many different lettuce varieties I tried over the years, but it always came down to that we love to eat the Zelanova lettuces from Johnny's. There are three varieties which are just so beautiful. They are those beautiful compact lettuce heads. Like one head is like a perfect amount for us to eat like as a side salad um, for dinner with the family. I really love those and they're easy to clean, easy to grow. They are not, um, they are not upset if they get hit over the head with a couple hot days in um, spring as we have it here we have like three days of spring and then <laughs> go straight into summer here but they don't get upset so much about it they actually deal with it nicely um, in those um, bridge seasons but it's just my favorite lettuce variety so the red butter green butter and the green crisp are the ones which I love the most and those ones are, I would argue, forever grow lettuce varieties for me. Be careful, um, they are pelleted seeds and they don't really germinate very well after a season. So I typically just get one seed package of each in the beginning of the year and make sure I'll use them up. The, the small packages has 25 seeds. Usually that's like what I'm able to grow here and there in between the seasons throughout the garden year without any issues and then once again a new variety of which I'm trying this year is a lettuce new introduction for this year from row seven seeds and it looked like an interesting one it's supposed to be super crunchy but the growth habit is not a full head but like a loose head so I'm really curious to see how that one goes um, got some seeds for that as well I'm definitely going to try that Moving on to winter squash. The winter squash last year was the first year where I only grew varieties which the dang squash wine borer doesn't care about. And I gotta tell you, it was glorious. A summer without 
being on the hunt of <laughs> squash vampora eggs, which if you know are those teeny, 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 tiny, like coppery eggs here and there, just one egg here, one egg there. You really need to go out with a magnifying glass to, to be able to catch those. I was so tired of it, killing my plants um, for the past season. So last year I grew only varieties which are not um, hollow in the stems where they can go in and eat the plants from the inside out. So it's um, like more like thick or it's, it's too, too rough for them to get inside of it. So it's beautiful. And as last year was so great in that regard, I'll do it this year again. Um, I'm feeling sad for the spaghetti squash and the delicata, which are on the uh, no-grow list for that reason. But simplicity, right? <laughs> simplicity. So, um, but row seven has some amazing, amazing varieties, which I grew last year for the first time. And boy, were they delicious. So those are the ones which we're growing again. First one up here is the Lodi squash, which was so cute. All of their squash varieties are more like single person variety squash, like from, from or single serving type of sizes. And they're just gorgeous. And like with squash, it's a little bit like with watermelons, I think. The smaller they are, the more compact the flavor is than rather than um, big squash. Bigger is not always better. <laughs> and in that regard, I think it's it's true in terms of taste. All of their varieties are small, but they are so packed with flavor. The Lodi squash was one which I loved. It was a really, really um, delicious one and super easy to roast. Like that's my, my favorite um, application to like roast any type of winter squash for um, as a side dish throughout the winter. Next up is the honey patch, which is a teeny tiny butternut squash. Again, like it's like it's like that big or at least for me, they were that big and really sweet like my squash has had last year a little bit of a rough um, patch with either the groundhog or the bunnies or both we're not fully sure who it was but they got eaten down twice and unfortunately for that reason they were not able to produce as much as they could have had in the length of the season so this year everything gets a fence around it um, right away I'm not taking any prisoners and <laughs> that I don't care about the looks I want to have some vegetables so everything is will be protected uh, well this year so i hope um, we will see a lot of those um, honey um, honey patch squashes because the small ones are perfect like again like personal sized squash really really easy not super seedy in the middle and easy to clean from from that regard so for that it's uh, perfect and then the next one is the kogi nut also really really delicious i would say out of the three we just talked about I felt like that was the most sweetest tasting or like almost it almost tasted to me like caramel when I um, roasted them like super sweet. I'm sure you could use that well for like pies or so as well, like delicious, really, really great. And then the one which is technically a winter squash, I do grow it as a summer squash, it's my center cut squash. If you followed me on Instagram last year, you will <laughs> remember my saga with the Santa Cut Squatch. I had two plants, just two plants last year. And within an, um, a 10 week time frame, I had over 88 fruits on this plant, totaling up to 150 pounds. <laughs> yes, so if you're looking for a plant which yields massively as long as you cut it that's that's the key from the moment you let it grow out as winter squash to get hard enough it stops producing but if you keep cutting them in the small like zucchini style and zucchini size um fruit stage they will not stop producing keep that as a warning if you grow them be warned i'm not allowed to grow more than one plan of that this year because we were swimming in it yes uh, last year i had it like i gave it to family to friends non-stop you know those memes where people like throw 
zucchinis into a car and run away or put it on doorstep. That was me last year, so I don't want to, I don't want to repeat that. Um, also, they're so fast growing. I would even argue they're faster growing than zucchinis. Like when I go on business travel, my partner goes picking them and he always says, sweetie, I went out every time you told me to <laughs> and came back with like uh, baseball clubs of plant, um, of like harvest. So be warned, but it's a great variety and it tastes so much better as zucchini. So ever since I started growing center cut squash, I haven't touched a zucchini plant ever since because again, they are resistant to the squash bambora, so much more productive, so much more easy to grow, yielding like crazy and just delicious. So that is definitely a recommendation of mine. Moving on to eggplants. Last year, I just grew one variety, which was gorgeous and which was super, super nice, but I found it a little bit boring. So this year I'm back to uh, two varieties. One is the Anina. That's the one I grew last year and boy, it was so beautiful. It was stellar in the, in the beauty department and also really, really delicious. But I felt I wanted to have a classic eggplant variety as well, which is um, the second variety I'm growing this year. It's called black egg, a little bit smaller, but this classic like dark purpley color from the eggplant. Um, so I'm excited for this. Moving on to the cucumber department. In all honesty, that's the department where I'm still struggling the most. I have yet to have a cucumber year, given the amount of cucumber plants I grow in a year. I should be dying under a mountain of cucumbers, <laughs> but I've never done that or I've never been in that situation yet. So I'm still trying to really master the game of cucumber growing. If you have any tips for me, please feel free to put them below. I would love to hear yours. They always succumb to um, diseases when the cucumber beetles come out, don't like the weather or whatever drama they, <laughs> they put on. Nevertheless, I love a garden cucumber, so I will die trying to make my cucumber dreams come true. So for that reason, I have um, this year um, three varieties. And for cucumbers, it's a little bit like with the tomatoes. We love pickles in this household. So once I get cucumbers, I love to pickle them. One other thing I love to do as well is making um, cucumber kimchi. It's so good. It's so delicious and it really um, preserves the cucumber so well. So most of my cucumber varieties are pickling varieties. So the first one is the little leaf. It's a really cute um, little one. <laughs> so that one worked decently well for me last year. So it's a repeat. The Boston pickling, um, same thing. So from all the cucumbers, those pi two pickled ones did the best for me. And then in the more salad compart department of the uh, cucumbers, the salad more worked well for me. It's supposed to be a bush variety, so it's not like all the other vining varieties of a cucumber. I have to say for me, they were still kind of vine vining around, not as big as the other ones, but I wouldn't, <laughs> I would not have dared to call it a bush variety, but we will see. So that one, I'll grow a couple, a couple of, as well. And then I got another variety from an experimental one from row 7 seed there, 7082 cucumber, which is supposed to be a pickling one as well. So we'll try that one out in the garden this year as well. And then, you know, one of my favorite things to grow is also basil. I literally tuck this into every bed, wherever I have a little bit of space open, there is a basil plant <laughs> in the corner or notched in eventually. And my two favorite varieties are for culinary basil. If you've watched my videos for the flower seeds I'm growing, you can put here a link on it. But if you watch that, you know I grow an even larger variety of basil for my cut flower garden. But here in the culinary department, I love the Nufor basil, which is a large like Genovese type basil. And then a new to me version, but also same, same style is the Prospera Italian large leaf basil. So I'm excited for those ones. And yeah, I just love a good pesto basil on my um, tomato sandwiches, right? Like basil makes everything better in the summer, no matter where you put it in. And 
another forever grow for me where I only grow two plants because that's plenty is the ground sherry. Ground sherries is, fun fact, it's in the tomato um, family. It's like a husk cherry or in tomatillo type, but it tastes like a tropical fruit. It tastes like a little bit like a mango, like it has a bright flavor, but it's, it's, it's a tropical flavor and it's so, so delicious. I love it. I just snack it from the plant or they, they fall down when they're ripe, not from the plant, but when, when they're ripe. And it's one of my favorite garden snacks. Makes also an amazing, amazing jam. Tastes like sunshine when you have that in the winter. <laughs> so that's my, my favorite uses, or you can put it in a pie or so. It's, it's delicious. So forever grow for me. I still have to find a way for the, those plants though to not like, they always like grow for me and fall with their branches down to the ground. Even from the raised beds, they eventually reach down to the ground. So I gotta see if I find a way to keep them a little bit uptight in their growing habit because that makes it really hard to like pick up the ground cherries um, after a while. So yeah, if you have an idea, let, leave me a comment here. I'm looking forward for suggestions in that department, but it's a forever grow for me. <clears throat> Another variety which I grew for uh, last year for the first time was a pole bean called Seychelles. And this one was such a stunning plant and the fruits were all the perfect shape. Like typically like what I had grown as pole beans before were all like very, very large and um, all like somehow stringy at uh, some stages. So you really had to be careful when you pick them otherwise they were already like too tough to eat those ones were perfection from the moment they were ripe <laughs> even when they were a little bit over um, when you cooked them you would not have noticed them that you picked them a few days too late so in my striving for simplicity this year those are the only pole beans i'm going to grow because they were so delicious and so great so the shells are the ones to move forward for me for the pole beans i'm still discussing if i will tuck a few um birch beans here and there but yeah they are always like they come in one big flush and they got to take them out again like Pole beans are so much more bang for your plant back because once they are like starting to produce, they typically don't stop. Maybe in the in the really, really heat of summer, they stop for like two, three weeks, but then they pick it up um, until frost comes. So that is why I, I think like pole beans are such a better plant in terms of yields and like spa space usage. And then in spring, I always love to grow also some peas. Although this year, um, I will try again, keeping it simple. They share a bed. That's the only thing what shares a bed a little bit um, is the the peas with the um, cucumbers and the winter squash because those go out fairly, fairly late in the, um, in the season. So I typically plant them out end of May, beginning of June when it's already warm because otherwise they get grumpy. <laughs> and that is when the peas are usually on their top and start producing for two, three weeks, but then they are gone. So they have a good cut over. And um, my favorite peas to grow is the sugar snap pea. That's my forever grow snap pea. It's just a classic, beautiful green snap pea, which is delicious. It's also called garden candy. And um, for a reason, because it's just so delicious and fresh. And it's typically the first vegetable I can eat out of my garden in spring, which always gets me so excited for everything else to come. And then one of the um, pea varieties from row seven again, last year I used their mix with the green and the purple ones, but I like the purple ones better. So we're doing the purple ones again. And I'm not sure how to pronounce the name, but it's called like Borogate or so, <laughs> but those ones are the purple ones. The cool thing with them is they keep their color 
in the pan. That's probably why they use this <laughs> cooked picture as the key picture um, on the website as well. But it is so cool because they truly do keep their color. Like everything, every other purple vegetable you might have grown before and um, cooked that typically turns brown uh, very quickly when you apply heat. But those ones keep their purpley color, which is gorgeous. And they are also super delicious. They have like a nutty side flavor, which is really, really hard to beat. So I'm excited to see those once again. And then we're in the last department of my um, vegetable garden plan is the pepper department. So you might know we're not a super spicy household, so we are growing more sweet pepper than um, spicy pepper varieties. But last year's peppers um, didn't do very well for me. So this year I'm just, <laughs> I threw up a lot of uh, varieties in the air to just um, grow some new and see how they are doing. One of one of the two, which is a repeat though, is my shishito peppers. Those ones have been always um, a good producer for me. We just love to grill them on a grill in the summer as a side dish, uh, sprinkle a little bit soy sauce over it and it's the perfect, um, the perfect super quick side dish uh, from the grill out of the garden. Everybody loves them, so we love to eat them. And then the other one, um, which I'll, repeat um, to grow is a patchwork, patchwork pepper from row seven. This one was so stunning. The plant didn't perform the greatest, I gotta say, but none of my peppers did. So it got a little bit grace um, in that department, but it was so pretty and it was, oh boy, so delicious. It was the best tasting pepper I've ever had. It is like sweet, but complex um, in a matter of like, it's really, really hard to describe. It's had like a nutty, but like deep, deep flavor. It was not as bright as you have it from other pepper plants. It's really hard to describe, but I can really recommend. It was delicious. It was so pretty. It has like with the stripes, almost in build in indicator when it's ripe. So you see it, it's dark purpley or almost brown pepper until it's almost ripe and then it flips to that um, red stripey color which is gorgeous so i can highly recommend those delicious those didn't last long um, in our fridge because we just love them to to eat them fresh with some hummus or so delicious and then the um, three new varieties I'm growing. One is the um, Yankee pepper, or Yankee bell pepper. It's just a plain um, red bell pepper, which I want to try. My trusty bell pepper for the past years was always the king of the north, but it really did poorly for me last year. So I was like, let's try something new. <laughs> and I'll try that uh, Yankee bell pepper, which is supposed to be good for um, northern gardeners as well. So we'll see about that. And another one which we like to use as well for um, like stuffed peppers and so is a pepplano pepper that feels already spicy to us. So don't <laughs> don't come at me saying it's not spicy if you're not um, if you don't like spice at all. This is still here and there a spicier one, but we love them like as as filled peppers etc. So I'm growing a couple of those and then the only remotely spicy pepper which we loved last year because I made cowboy candy out of it was a jalapeno. So I'm actually growing a couple more plants so I have some more to can more um, cowboy candy because that got eaten so quick. <laughs> so I want to I want to make some more for that out of this year's garden. And it's also super easy to do like you just cook it in syrup and some spices and then can it so it was not um, the biggest effort. So I'm curious and looking forward to do that. All right, so those were all my varieties, um, which I'm planning to grow this year. As you can clearly tell, I'm so excited to get started with the seeds again and just, um, yeah, cherishing the moments um, up to the point of having my plants in the garden performing again and hopefully yielding well. I always love to hear from other gardeners what are your favorite forever grow varieties in your garden. So let me know that in the comment. I always love to note those ones down and check them out when I need replacement varieties uh, for next year. But yeah, if you have any questions, um, let me know in the comments as well. Otherwise, subscribe and watch another video. Thank you.